<laughs> and he was slightly oh, wrong. <laughs> Why is it um, OS2 looks so much like Windows 95? Uh, that's a good question, because why shouldn't it? I mean, after a while, there is a sort of standard that people like and expect. Look, why does why did Windows 95 look like the Macintosh interface, in a way? Yeah. I guess so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once people got the idea of a GUI, of a graphical user interface, I mean, the principles were sort of the same. I mean, it's an interesting question. I remember some years ago... Uh, when there was there were a lot of competitive spreadsheets on the market, and there were five or yeah. six different spreadsheets you could buy, and there was a big intellectual property patent copyright issue going out there about, you know, can you own the layout of a spreadsheet and the layout of the menus on top and so on, and one of the guys, uh, a guy named Philippe Kahn, who ran a company called Borland that had a very good spreadsheet program out there, uh, was actually sued by. I think it was Lotus at the time, for stealing the spreadsheet interface. And he made a very good point. He said, he said, there are certain things you can't own. He said, can you imagine that if you come out with a car, you're going to tell me that Ford owns where the clutch goes and where the brake goes and where the steering wheel goes? Yeah, and where the you wheels go. You that. You know, there are certain yeah. standards that simply have to be accepted and people have the right to use those. I think uh, everyone just took the idea from the GUI. I mean, like, they're designed from Linux, because wasn't Linux the first one to come out with a GUI? No, 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 no. There was so. the um, oh, it was Xerox. Xerox yeah, was the first yeah, it was, one. Yeah, was, yeah, right. It was, oh, it was Xerox, Xerox Park. Linux. Really. I don't know what yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. I meant Xerox, but yeah. Oh, yeah, they were the and first then, ones. Of course, and, of course, I mean, frankly, Apple and Steve Jobs stole it from Xerox. Yeah, they did. They just, well, at least, I mean, they just took it. Absolutely, but yeah, absolutely, they, it's the guys at Xerox Park that developed the GUI and the mouse interface and all that. Sure. Then they uh, pay like ten thousand. Uh, peanuts, like, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Okay, there's one more question I've been personally wanting to ask you, Stuart. Sure. Um, okay, as you're aware, um, okay, uh, talking about something quite complicated and making it understandable for and like a non-average computer person, or you know, like the average non-computer person, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, lately there has been like a boom in like game reviewers on the internet and stuff like that who are yeah. like starting to find their voice and sharing lots of advice and stuff like that in that department. Right. Right. Um, what advice have you got for like people, you know, who are doing these shows, you know, trying to relate this complicated, you know, kind of technical jargon to a uh, wider audience who isn't, you know, so much game related? Well, Even that's maybe game that's... related but not technical related but, you know, just trying to translate it down. Well, that's that's the real challenge, and I think, as I think uh, you suggested earlier, that was, I think, one of the things I'm proud of of what we do with Computer Chronicles. I mean, that's the whole point, is how do you explain complicated things to people who don't have the ability or the time or the patience to deal with complicated stuff? And in the early days, you know, you really had to know how to, you know, take the computer apart and figure out an awful lot of things, and you had to install, you know, drivers and flip dip switches and on and on and on and on. Yeah, and, and even uh, breaking that down to um, semi-complicated talk is still hard, you know? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's a real challenge. I mean, the, the good news in a way is, you know, technology really has gotten so much simpler than it was. I remember there was a time, you know, uh, we were talking to, I think it was Macworld Magazine at the time, about becoming one of the sponsors of our show, and I had a very interesting conversation with the guy who was the editor of Macworld, and he said, you know, we're really worried about our business. And at that time, I mean, computer magazines were really big. And he said, he said, you know, I used to be in the photography magazine business, and there used to be 30 magazines about photography, and now there's about two. Because cameras, you don't have to know anything about a camera anymore. You press the button. In the old days, you had to know about aperture and this and AS, uh, film speeds and so on and so forth. And he said, when things get simple, nobody needs magazines anymore. Nobody needs these things anymore. And to some degree, that's happened with computers, where uh, or most technology, which is it, it is relatively simple. Yeah. Even if you're a gamer, you don't have you don't have to know a lot, you know, to take advantage of most of the stuff. But the, 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 it's really, really difficult to. I always thought of myself as a as like a UN translator, you know, translating geek talk into yeah. normal talk, yeah. so that people could understand what the hell you were talking about when you <laughs> had to deal with complicated subjects. And did you understand what they would, what the uh, what the technical people were talking about all the time, or? Yeah, well, I mean, um, it was another interesting example of that. Is yeah, there were 
you know, we would have guests on the show. It was classic. If we'd have on some mid-level guy who was a programmer or a developer of some sort, he could come in and whiz through demonstrations and explain everything. The real problem was when the CEO would come on as a guest, and he didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> and he had to bring some guy who behind the scene, press over here and press that. And, do <laughs> and so even even within the industry, you know, the knowledge was really at a mid-level somewhere with the guys who actually did stuff. But often the people running these businesses really didn't understand the technology either. They understood the business and the sales side of it. Yeah. So yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's always been that way. That's like uh, Bill Gates getting a blue screen. You got it. You got it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you another funny Bill Gates story. We're talking about Microsoft and Apple. Yeah. There was, I, I think it was maybe the introduction of Windows 98, I believe it was at a Comdex. And uh, Bill Gates was on stage doing this big introduction. And, of course, he had all these effects and the rolling videos and music and all that. And all this stuff in a little dark room behind the stage was coming off Macintoshes. <laughs> Really? Oh. Yes. <laughs> oh. Wow. Right. Wouldn't that be an interesting photo to have, you know? Yeah. Oh, my, oh my God. Well, I happen, I happen to know a guy who was working on that presentation who was back there in that little dark room. And he came to me afterward and he said, could you believe we're doing this on a Mac? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So the introduction of Windows 98 was presented on a Mac. Because you know it was a better platform for doing multimedia at the time. Yeah, they were they were they they managed to uh, utilize the CPU a lot better back then, didn't they? Oh yeah. Well, of course. I mean, the the, the, the first brilliant media machine was the Amiga. Yeah, that all the video. I, mean, I remember ga games on the Amiga were were light years ahead of anything else on the Apple yeah. or the PC. I mean, the Amiga graphics and sound were extraordinary in the early days. I loved using a video toaster. I love doing oh yeah, you know Toaster, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's a great. Oh yeah, I know those guys very well. Yeah, I remember I was watching an episode where you were interviewing uh, some people. I think it was for the Amiga 3000. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the Toaster was it was a brilliant. I mean, that was the first time you could actually use your computer to do video and television. Yeah. Was with the toaster. But look, think of that too. I mean, the toast when that Toaster board came out, that was about five thousand bucks for the card. Yeah. As you say, in your four hundred dollar laptop, you can do you can do video editing all you want. Yeah. Well, it was like two hundred dollars just for a meg of RAM back then, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. Exactly. I remember paying, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a ten megabyte memory card for a PC. Hey, you can go out and pay twenty dollars to get a gig or two of RAM. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's all good news, isn't it? That these things do get better and cheaper. Yeah, that's good. They sure do. They sure do. I mean, thank goodness. I mean, that we can buy, you know, as you say, you know, a pretty damn good Toshiba laptop for under five hundred dollars now. Well, actually, I mean, it's eight hundred, but yeah. Whatever, but I mean, hey, it's um, unbe really unbelievable. Yeah. Stuart, have you ever been to the computer museum? Oh, of course. How, how, how do you? What do you think of it? Like in comparison to your experience over the years of computers. You talking about the one here in the Bay Area? Um. Because the original computer museum was in Boston. Okay, yes, that's the one I was And the original, was original, the original, original computer museum was a digital equipment corporation outside Boston. That, that's a history. Oh. I mean, the guy who ran DEC, <coughs> DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, was like yep. the rest of it. He collected all this junk. And he had a garage full of stuff. And he actually went to somebody in Boston and said, we should turn this into a museum. And he actually, the museum started in his house. And then at some wow. point they took all this junk and they moved it over to, in, into this computer museum in downtown Boston. But they went out of business and then they moved all that stuff out here to California. And during the dot-com bust in about 2002, when lots of companies went out of business and there was all kinds of empty offices, they were able to buy this huge building for like a million bucks, whereas before it was worth $10 million, And that became the home of the computer museum here. 